Hello, everybody. Tom, I'm so sorry that um, we're running a little bit late. We've had a few weather and technical difficulties, but we are here. I'm here with the lovely Trisha Brook. And the um, subject today is um, your big talk and um, finding your voice. So I'm really excited by that. So before we get started and I introduce Trisha, um, how many of you think that you have a TED talk in you? And how many of you think you don't? You certainly don't. I'm um, somewhere on the fence. I'd love to do it, but not entirely sure whether I know what to talk about. So <laughs> luckily, luckily, oh yeah, Katrina Young. Yes, she does. Brilliant. Um, so luckily we've got the lovely Trisha Brooke here and she is the lady for you, whatever your answer to that question is. She is a writer. She writes for theatre, film and television. She's an award-winning director and she is the executive producer of TEDx Lincoln Square. Um, and she also um, teaches people how the art of public speaking. So she can answer all your questions on, on how to get up on that stage and make it a great success. Trisha, welcome. Thank, Thank you so you much for so being much. here. Thank you, Catherine. I'm thrilled to be here. And I'm sorry, everyone, to keep you waiting. Big technical difficulties. We had a huge snowstorm in New York City yesterday. So my Wi-Fi was very spotty. And fingers crossed it will stay on the entire time I'm with you today. Yeah, I, I, I think it will. I think it will. Positive thinking. Yes. <laughs> so um, so a big talk. What, what is it? What, what is someone's big talk? How do you define it? I think every talk is a big talk because when we have important stories to share with the world or with our family or with our friends, those talks are impactful. And I think if we consider those talks and those stories with impact and we consider how we could potentially change someone's point of view or way of thinking by simply sharing a story, that's a big talk. And sure, TEDx and TED Talks and keynotes are big talks. But I like to consider all storytelling a big talk because you do have the potential of changing how somebody thinks. And that's pretty impressive. So how can, um, you know, learning the art of crafting your big talk make a difference to you, to your, to your business? I mean, how important is it? Well, if we define big talk as in terms of a life-changing or a signature talk, one that is a keynote that you're going to uh, take to events and conferences, or a big talk that you're going to pitch TEDx events with, those particular big talks can A, elevate your credibility. TEDx speakers have immediate credibility because they've been invited to become a TEDx speaker and speak about something important on a TEDx platform. And somebody who has a signature big talk that takes it around events and conferences, they then begin to become well known with that information and they become, for example, Lolly Daskal. She speaks on leadership. So she's the go-to person for any kind of big talk on leadership. And you think about um, people who have marketing talks, they, they begin to become the go-to person for marketing or branding. So if you create a signature talk or a keynote that is specific to your area of expertise, you can then start to work the speaking circuit and get paid a lot of money with this one talk. So do you think everybody, I mean, I'm sitting here thinking I wouldn't know what my talk would be. I mean, do you think everybody has that signature talk in them? I think everybody has something important to share and a story that can be told. If you have an idea that you aren't sure about, it's important to start asking people around you, is this idea interesting? Do you find this idea thought provoking? Do you think you'd want to hear somebody talk about this idea for 18 minutes or for 45 minutes? So just like previewing a Broadway show, you want to start asking people for feedback on what your idea is. And what I find is really interesting about this process working with speakers is that people come to me with one idea or they come to me with no ideas or they come to me with many ideas. And those three places is where most people live. And what's great is when I come, when I work with somebody who has one idea, we do an active listening session and I, I help them realize that their idea is much bigger than they thought or the initial idea they come to me with becomes something else. 
And then I, I work with people who have no ideas. And what we do is we mine for those ideas. And I ask them tons of questions so that we can begin to identify the one idea they're most passionate about. And then those people who come to me with many ideas, we start to identify the one that they're most passionate about and that hasn't been discussed very much. So there's three, there's three sort of camps of people with ideas. And what's important to remember and what I invite your audience to continue to consider is that, yes, your story matters and people will respond to it. And the people who are moved by your idea and your big talk are going to be the ones that you make a difference in their lives. So it's important to know that. It's funny, actually, because Susie Parker just said in the previous um, interview, I don't know if you heard, yeah. she said, your story is magnetic. And I think it's really true because it's the thing that you can talk about with real passion and really authentically. And, it, it, you know, if you can just identify what your angle is um, that makes you stand out, it, it can be really powerful. Right. I mean, I'm just interested to know what the um, what the people listening, does, I mean, how, where do you sit in those camps? Does anyone... Do you have no ideas, one idea, many ideas that you don't want to do? Just comment on the um, chat and let us know and, and we'll, we'll keep an eye on that and keep talking. But um, so if you if we're sitting at home thinking, OK, I fall into one of those three camps. I have no ideas. Let's say, for example, how are you going to how do you you know, when you don't have the privilege of being able to sit down with someone like you? How can how can you? find, you know, identify what is my big talk? That's such a great question. And I invite everyone and I encourage everyone to ask yourself simple questions and get yourself a journal that you can write down the answers. So a simple question would be what makes you happy? And I don't mean like the epic what is creating my deep happiness. That's awesome. But I mean, cooking, painting, playing with your cat, playing with your fam your, do your dog, playing with your children, being with your family, uh, rollerblading. Find those things that make you happy and write lists about all of those things. And then you want to sort of ask yourself, what's, what's, what am I scared of? What am I, what's one of my biggest fears? And write those things down too, like um, being late. And I'm, I, I mean silly things in addition to the big things, like I'm not good enough or nobody cares about my idea. Write it all down. Um, write down things. What am I really good at? What am I really bad at? So that you start asking yourself questions and you get out of your headspace of what's my big idea because we grip on that and then we go nowhere. So if you can start to become free in your thinking, all of a sudden, it will take you down a path that you never thought you would explore. And at that moment, you may just land on a big idea. So that's what I would encourage you to start doing is start asking yourself questions, write down those answers. And when you're out walking around or driving or uh, at dinner, observe observe everything around you and we all get turned on by something whether it's a smile of a child when we're walking down the street or whether it's a beautiful bouquet at a restaurant when we're having dinner write those things down because we often forget that we are human beings and we're responsive to things that can potentially become ideas we have to sort of let go of the idea of being an entrepreneur and what's the strategy behind my big idea so i can get on a stage and i can get more book sales and i can make sure that people understand that i'm a i'm a thought leader if you let go of all of that for a moment and a moment meaning like a couple of months and start to investigate what turns you on and what makes you tick as a human being, all of a sudden, all of these really amazing ideas will start to flow out of you. So it's not necessarily going to be the most obvious subject. So, you know, that, you know, so for example, I'm a journalist, so my subject's not necessarily going to be um, <clears throat> how to write a feature, you know, that kind of thing. It could be anything is what makes me unique really as a journalist is that, that finding that thing. that's right or why you love talking to people you know that idea of the reason I love talking to people is because I'm constantly surprised and here's why you know that's that's mm -hmm. directly related to what you do but it's not about how to be a journalist or what makes a good yeah. journalist it's what makes you unique as the storyteller 
and it's what makes you tick. So do, do, does, do people in the audience have an idea already of what, what they have, what makes them tick or is it something that you're going to have to work on now, sit down and work on? Um, let us know in the comments. Um, actually, interestingly, um, we talk a lot about, I've been learning a lot about, you know, different ways of kind of exploring your mindset and, and journaling obviously is a, a big thing and that's a good way of perhaps tapping into things that you don't consciously realize matter to you you know sitting down and doing journaling every day and what what interests you and what you know just see what rises to the top is you know Absolutely. it's a really good way of identifying it it's a little bit of mind mapping but it's a little bit less structured less structured version of mind mapping so if you begin to write these answers and these thoughts in your journal then you can pick and choose a few and then you know use that as your your base and then start to ex Explore and expand on that and all of a sudden you'll have all of these incredible ideas and your challenge will be choosing the one which is my hope yeah. for you well I'm just looking at the comments and we've got um, a big mix we've got um, uh, a million ideas Joanna says she's got a million ideas just not sure how to become an expert and package it um, okay and uh, Hannah says I've fallen into giving talks on publicizing your art. My first talk on Monday. Oh, brilliant. Well done. Congratulations. Brilliant. And uh, Lindsay says she's going to have to sit down and work on it. So, okay. So we all know you, you've kind of explained to us, you know, the first step, the first step of kind of trying to identify your, your big idea and, and the one that is kind of outstanding. I mean, when you have several ideas, is it just a, you know, which one, pulls you the most is, is that how you choose or I think the one that you're most connected to from your heart is the one you're going to be able to speak passionately and most vulnerably about and mm -hmm. that's you know now that you've asked me this question I have to also say that the one that you are most scared of might be the one that you should talk about because when we are afraid to talk about something that is very personal, often we push that aside. I can't be that naked. I can't be that vulnerable in front of my audience. But ultimately, that's the one you should probably share with the world. <laughs> yeah, that's the one that people haven't heard before. That's right. From your point of view, you're going to tell it from yeah. a very unique point of view. And that's what makes it special. Brilliant. So, um, so you've got your, you've got the bones of what your, um, what your, big talk is going to be about you've got the idea so what, what do we need to do next how do we turn it into something which I think is the most daunting part you know turning it into something that people want to listen to that's a really great question because the idea of writing is terrifying and there's so many ways to avoid doing it whether it's being on social media whether it's cleaning your apartment whether it's watching television we can find ways to avoid sitting down and writing so easily so oh, yeah. what I would suggest is after you have identified your idea, then start talking about it. Put on a voice recorder and begin to talk about why this idea is important to you. And really, really think about why it's important to you, what you want your audience to come away with, when you first got the idea, where were you, what were you thinking, how will this idea shape the world, how will this idea become globally impactful, not just uh, uniquely impactful to your community. So if you talk this out and you record it, then you can transcribe all of this information and then all of a sudden what you have is an, an active listening session that you had alone. I do active listening sessions with my clients where I ask them tons of questions and I get them to reveal all of this incredible material and personal information and then from that, and I'm asking you to do this active listening session solo, so you record yourself, you transcribe that, and you've got this document that you can then turn into a blueprint. So from this document of all of these ideas and questions and answers that you've asked yourself and that you've prompted and that you've thought about, and I do mean think about what's the global impact, what's the community impact, what do I want my audience to walk away with? How is this interesting? What's unique about it? Why is it unique because of my point of view? Ask yourself all of those questions and then create a blueprint from the answers. And what I mean by blueprint is choose the topic from the document that you transcribe from this active listening session. Choose a topic and write it on a three by five note card. And when you have that topic written down, flip it over and explore it even more, expand it even more. 
write satellite ideas and thoughts based on this one topic and then fill your table full of three by five note cards from this active listening session document. Once you have your table filled with 20 or 30 note cards, this is your blueprint and what you get to do next is really fun. You get to move the cards around and all of a sudden you've got a structure. So now you've got your cards in the order that you're going to begin writing your first draft. So I give you these techniques so that it's not, oh my God, I have to write, I have a blank page and I, I, I'm frozen. If you, yeah. if you do the exercises of recording yourself with an active listening session, transcribe that into a document, use that document to create a blueprint. And all of a sudden you have a blueprint to write your first draft. That's fantastic advice. Cause actually, even though I write for a living, I write all the time there is that kind of thinking whenever I'm faced with a subject, oh my goodness, where am I going to start? Yeah. And you just have to start. And right. it is amazing when you just start exploring ideas and writing notes where it leads you. And it's really surprising um, what you don't know is hidden in your brain somewhere. It's so true. And yeah, so it's really, it's, it's such a brilliant tool for mining the depths of your your experience and your wisdom and getting it all down there. And that's, I love the kind of physical idea of having them on cards as well. So you can actually see the structure of your talk there and hold it in your hand and think this is how it could work. Right. It's, brilliant. it's a tangible action rather than just this um, ethereal, yes, exactly, ethereal, how do I grab the words from <laughs> from nowhere? So it's it's very helpful. Excellent. So you've got your, you've got your, um, all the elements that you think are going to make up your talk and you can figure out your structure. And then it's just a matter of crafting it into, into your talk. I mean, what's the next process? What, how would you advise doing that? Then? I think what you want to think about at this point is your talk a keynote or is it a TEDx or a TED talk? And those two animals are very different. If you mm -hmm. are crafting a keynote, you understand that the event organizer or the conference planner has a specific set of needs from you. So you wanna meet those needs. You want the idea to um, have certain calls to action. You want there to be several takeaways. You want the audience to be given what the event organizer is asking for from you. Mm -hmm. So you want to make sure that those are being hit in your talk. And it's also usually about 45 minutes to an hour long. So you have the opportunity to really expand your introduction, your body and your conclusion, along with the calls to action at the end. If you are crafting a TEDx, that's a very different animal in the sense that it is a gift, not an ask. It is an idea, not an issue. And you want your audience to potentially adopt your idea as their own at the end of your performance. So those are the, the differences between a keynote and a TED or a TEDx talk. So when you begin to, let's just talk about TED and TEDx for a minute. When you begin to write your TED talk or your TEDx style talk, you're limited to 18 minutes. And Chris Anderson has been quoted as saying, 12 is the new 18, which I love, <laughs> because you can you can say what you need to in 12 minutes for sure. Yeah. So that, that gives you parameters right away. So you understand that you have to get to the point much sooner. You have to explain the complex idea thoroughly and very succinctly. And then you need to close and get out. <laughs> and okay. so it's really important that you understand how to open, how to explain these complex ideas with very few points, maybe three points maximum. And then you want to make sure you close once so that we are left wanting more. Okay. How do you all feel about that? Does it feel like something that you feel like you could sit down and, and do? Let us know in the, in, in the comments. Um, I think um, it, it's as I always think that time constraints and word counts, they're such important things. They're they such valuable tools because, you know, the more concise something is, the, the more powerful your message is. And so, you know, you shouldn't feel constrained by them. You should feel like you just know that you're going to put down exactly, you know, what is what is needs to be said. And right. yeah, so that's, you know, brilliant. So um, one of the things that um, actually we should then go, so you've now um, got to the stage where we've, 
you've three points you're saying there should be in, in a kind of 18 minute talk. Is that what you're kind of saying? You probably want three points. I think three points is enough. You don't want to give the audience more to think about because they'll be confused and they won't be able to really understand fully what your idea worth spreading is. Right. So what are the um, other key elements that you need in crafting your, your big talk? You've got your three points and, and your introduction and, and your close, presumably. Uh, what would your tips and advice be on that? What's really important is when you are giving a TEDx is that you you go back to what it's what it's about. It's about an idea worth spreading. It's about creating an idea that has a global impact so that it's not specifically about where you are in your location or in your community. And it has to be a gift, not an ask. And you never, ever want to pitch your business or your book or use the TEDx platform for any kind of self-promotion. It is literally about ideas worth spreading. So going back to mining for these ideas and whether or not it should be directly connected to who you are as an entrepreneur, it might be, but it has to definitely be your idea, not why you do what you do. So that's really important. for example, I worked with a speaker last year named Kristen Smedley, who is an incredible woman. She'd been speaking for 16 years about uh, retinal disease. She has three children, and two were born blind with a very rare retinal disorder. So she came to me, and this was before I was a TEDx organizer, and she said, I want to put out into the universe that I, I'm going to do a TEDx in the next year. And I said, great, let's start working on it. So we had our active listening session. And by the end of that session, I said, Kristen, and she started the Retinal Awareness Foundation. So this was her foundation. It was definitely part of who she was as a business and an entrepreneur. And after our session together, I said, Kristen, your talk isn't about raising awareness for retinal disease. It's about how you learn to see the world differently through the eyes of your children. And it was a complete shift for her because it, the talk became global. We as people can relate to how we see through the eyes of other people and how we see other people through our eyes. So we don't have to have blind children to understand her talk and to be moved into action. So that was something that was really important. And that's something that I want your, your audience to sort of understand is that Yes, she is the foundation head, but this talk wasn't about the foundation. It was about her and how she learned to see the world differently and was able to understand that the limitations she was, the limitations she saw for her sons were those she put on them. They played sports with sighted sports teams. They went skiing and and swimming and they did they're amazing kids they came to the event last year by the way um so also what's amazing and just a side note is when you put out into the universe obviously we all believe this things come to Uh you so she and i began working together and i was not yet a tedx organizer and then i realized i have to find a place for this woman to do this talk she's so talented and as a theater producer what i do is produce shows so the next thing i did was apply to get my TEDx license because I wanted to put her on my stage. So it was a really amazing gift for us to meet. And uh, her talk is special. Fantastic. I mean, that's that's such a great example of what you were saying before about um, putting your vulnerability out there and finding a way of getting your audience to connect with you personally and and the story that only you can tell. And that's just such a fantastic story. And it's interesting how, you know, obviously her obvious talk was not certainly not the one that was going to have the biggest impact and it's just by exploring it through the methods that we've just discussed you really can pull the gems out you know that's really really fantastic so um what um i think a lot of people think about um obviously you come from a theater background so you know all about performing um so there's one part which is writing your speech and coming up with your big idea but then there's a it's a whole other ball game when you're thinking about getting up on stage and presenting it and you know creating an impact i mean what's you know what are the biggest mistakes people make whenever they're wanting to 
present something and it, and it just doesn't quite go right. This is such a wonderful question, Catherine, because I know for a fact the biggest mistake people make is rehearsing alone in front of a mirror. You think you know your words, you think you know your beats, you think you know your intention and your pauses, and you are rocking it when you're by yourself. The moment you get in front of an audience, your body betrays you. Whether it's queasy stomach, whether it's flop sweats, whether it is a dry mouth, your body is going to betray you when you get on a stage in front of people. So when that happens, if you have never done your talk in front of others, you will forget everything. So the biggest mistake you can make is be alone in this on this journey. You have to start rehearsing under mild stress. So once you have your talk memorized, and that is something, let me just back up. Memorizing a talk is just like a dancer doing a million plies. We do millions of plies in order to get off the ground and land so that you only see that beautiful grand jeté. We don't want to see your preparation or your landing. So with speaking, you have to rehearse. You have to memorize that talk and rehearse and rehearse and rehearse and rehearse. And what happens is you go from not knowing the words to knowing the words and it's sounding like you're reciting the words moving past that and through to the other side where all of a sudden you know the words so well, it's conversational. So you've mm -hmm. got memorizing, not knowing them, repeating over and over. You've got, now I know them and I sound like I'm just a robot, but you have to push past that and get to, now I know them so well, I can perform them. I can have a conversation with my audience because I know exactly what I need to say and how I need to say it. So once you're through that process of your plies, then you go into the mild stress of delivering your big talk in front of people who are not going to judge you, like your family. <laughs> then you move into more stress. So increase the stress a little bit, maybe your coworkers, and then increase the stress a little bit more, maybe a large group of people or a small event. And you can say to them, I really need your support. I need to give this talk in front of as many people as possible so that when I step onto the TEDx stage, I understand when you're going to laugh. I understand when I need to pause. I understand how the audience is going to respond because you are having a conversation. You are doing a scene with the audience, even though they don't respond to you verbally. There is yeah. an interaction there. So you want to know by doing previews, by practicing with audiences, how it's going to land. So ask them for your support. And I don't mean ask them for feedback. You do not, once you've got your talk written, you do not want a room full of strangers to give you feedback on your talk. That part is over. You've gotten your feedback. You are now dealing with just the performance quality. So mild stress, increase the stress, increase the stress even more and do it over and over and over again until it's in your DNA. So it's not about what they're going to say about your performance. It's just about the actual act of doing it right over and over again right and getting used to it and and that doesn't mean you can't ask for feedback early on but once you are at the stage where I know this is my talk and I know this talk lands and I know they laugh here and I know this part wasn't good so I cut it out once you start to just get into rehearsal mode no don't ask for feedback from anyone it'll throw you Talking about feedback, actually, though, when you're coming up with your big idea and you're crafting your speech, I mean, is that something, because you mentioned about asking friends and family, what, what is it that lights me up? I mean, would you then take that big idea and say to them, is this something, I mean, how important as having sounding boards at that stage when you've... It's really important. And the reason it's important is because you want to ask people who, who are in your field if they understand it. And, and who, who know who you are. And then you want to ask people who are not in your field, who don't know who you are, if they understand it. So you want to make sure that as an expert, you are not talking above anyone and that you're explaining these complex ideas so that somebody like me who's never studied science uh, or epidemiology understands what you're sharing with us. Yeah, yeah, okay. So um, one of the things um, I think a lot of people think I want to do these big talks. I, I, okay, so you're thinking, yes, I want that exposure. I'm going to come up with a fantastic idea and I want to engage with people and spread these ideas. 
but then how do you i know hannah was saying that she started doing um doing um talks on art on um but how do you find these platforms i mean obviously tedx and ted talks brilliant but you know do you start on a small stage and work your way up or should you be automatically aiming for a for a ted tedx well i always say if you have a story or an idea it's time to take it off of your bucket list and put it on your to-do list aiming for a tedx stage is absolutely something you should think about because you have an idea that could potentially change somebody's life and that's what's important so I just did season eight on the Big Talk My podcast where I interviewed 15 TEDx organizers from all over the world, including Germany and India and Nigeria and Aruba, as well as several uh, national organizers. And I asked them many questions, but I asked them each this question, which was, how would you feel if someone directly approached you about being on your TEDx stage? And all but one said, we love it. So I would suggest reaching out to your community and you can find local organizations, local events. If you go to TED.com, reach out to your local TEDx organizers and ask them, what's your theme? What are you looking for? What kind of speakers do you want at your event? And start a dialogue with them because they will respond. And they really love when you ask them questions about what it is they need and what it is they want because they can tell you directly and then you can fill that void for them if it's something that is exciting for you. It may actually spark an idea that you hadn't thought of. Okay. You know, as, a, as an organizer for TEDx Lincoln Square in New York City, along with my co-producer, Jamie Broderick, we come up with themes. So... Last year, the theme was risk takers and change makers, and certain people reached out to us based on that theme. And this year, the theme was looking beyond. So we had a whole different group of speakers reach out to us based on that theme resonating with who they are. So yeah. reach out to organizations and ask them what they're looking for. Ask them what kind of event they have. How big is it? There's salons. There's TEDx salons all over the place. There's TEDx women events. And that's the way to start, to jumpstart your career as a speaker. If you have TEDx speaker next to your bio, next to your name, next to your signature, it automatically elevates your credibility as a speaker. And then you can start reaching out to bigger platforms, events, conferences, places who want people like you with your idea to speak about that for paid gigs. And people are start, you know, people are going to start coming to you. Right. Yeah, That's right. Um, just, just to say, ask, ask any questions. We're going to have some questions um, throughout as we go. So please do ask any questions you have for Trisha because she is such a, a font of information on this. So don't miss the opportunity. And I'm going to be keeping an eye. Um, Raimondo, I actually can't see any um, the question box at the moment for some reason. So please alert me if there's anything in there that I should be seeing. Um, but uh, just getting back to it. Um, so what is it that makes... Um, a talk really resonate with an with an audience you know is there is there one thing you know when you're up on stage that really is going to make make or break it well i think what breaks a talk is when you are not authentically yourself when you walk out onto the stage and you try to be someone you think the audience wants you to be there's a disconnect and the audience may not know why they don't trust you but it's because you're not being yourself so I, am, I am encourage everyone to trust that who you are is absolutely the right person to be when you walk out onto that stage. Mm -hmm. So that's something that you, you want to consider. The next thing is your actual talk. And this is why you want to consider your idea. Is it unique? Is it fresh? Are you really sharing this idea worth spreading through your point of view? I had a conversation with someone yesterday who is doing a TEDx in Florida in May and she is a jazz musician and she's doing a talk about business and jazz and I think first of all that's a really interesting idea because they're completely juxtaposed and I, I asked her would you consider playing the piano during your talk would you consider you know scoring your talk and she was terrified at that idea 
and then embraced it and then got so excited by it. So when you think about how you can, I consider my TEDx event to be theatrically academic. I want people to talk about things like space travel and dormant viruses, but I also have entertainment and I have a speaker who's going to play the guitar. She's a singer songwriter from Nashville. She's going to play the guitar while she gives her talk. So if you can think about how to turn your talk into a creative expression of complex ideas, you will stand out from other speakers. And I don't mean you have to dance. I don't mean you have to sing. <laughs> if you are a dancer, by all means, incorporate movement. But it's really about thinking outside of the box, creating theatrical academia that will fit within the event you apply for. Do you also mean things like, you know, some people have like little kind of cartoon slides or something to accompany and illustrate their points, you know, that kind of thing, you know, just by visual, just by simply creating a, you know, maybe a, a humorous um, slideshow of, to illustrate your point. If is it, is that, that as well. Absolutely. If slides propel the story forward, then use them. If slides do not help you tell your story or do not move your story forward, you don't need them. A lot of speakers rely on slides because they're afraid they're not going to remember their talk. So they look back and then they're prompted. The worst thing you can do is lose eye contact with the audience because it will take them several moments to come back to you. Yeah, interesting. So you want to stay on the audience. If you decide to use slides, get familiar with when you're clicking. Don't look back. Don't use it as a crutch. Do not use your slides yeah. as a crutch. Only use them if they're mm -hmm. propelling your story forward or supporting your story somehow. If you're doing oh, a I talk about scuba diving, you want to show images of scuba diving. If you're doing a talk about the, um, let's see, if you're doing a talk about the the most amazing toolery in Holland, you want to show pictures of that. So mm -hmm. if you're doing a talk that is supported by images, then absolutely use those images but only if yeah. it's propelling your story forward and yeah and you're not going to be relying on them to kind of um yeah support you right so um lindsay's just commented saying it's very interesting but i'm very i'm very scared of public speaking and i think that's uh that's just so common i think that's what's going to put you know puts a lot of people off from taking this step yeah. um what would i mean do you think that you know, it's something that you can overcome. I mean, how do you overcome it? Is it just by making yourself do it? It's, it is. It is by making yourself do it. The more you do it, the more comfortable you'll become. It does not mean that those butterflies are going to go away or that you're going to stop having stage fright. But what I, what I often say to my speakers is that your message is so important. Allow that to be why you're willing to go through the stress of public speaking. Allow the idea of you changing somebody's life or helping somebody see the world differently to be so important that you're willing to risk the fear of judgment and embarrassment of going in front of people. And that's something that you have to sort of embrace. You will be judged. People will have something to say about you. They will criticize you. We just have to go bring it on because uh -huh. you can't not put yourself out there and expect to never be judged or criticized. But what's important is that you are completely aligned with who you are as a speaker, with what your message is, so that you know no matter what, your intention and your authentic voice is worth it. Mm -hmm. So the, the benefits of putting yourself out there is, you know, it outweighs any of the kind of negatives of being worried about being judged or anything like that, or worried about being seen. I think a lot of people, you know, you hide behind, um, you know, emails or uh, written, the written word, and then suddenly you're out there and people can see your face, they can hear your actual voice. And um, it's much more terrifying than writing your ideas down and you can't see what the reaction is. That's right, can you? that's right. And what I'd like to also remind you and remind your listeners of is that the audience wants you to win. Mm -hmm. They are on your side. So the moment you walk out onto the stage, they cannot wait to hear what you want to share with us because you are the expert. You are the person that is going to share information with them that they haven't heard before and they cannot wait. So when you walk out onto that stage, take a moment to accept the gift 
from the audience of being there before you give them yours mm -hmm. so that it's a very shared experience. Um, the one thing, the, one of the things that we haven't talked about, which we, which we meant to, is finding your voice. And as in, um, and I mean that from the point of view, not like literally your speaking voice, but your voice, your, you know, the, what makes you different, the way you um, deal with the subject, the way you describe a subject. Um, how do you, um, I think, when you write something and you're not used to writing, you can often end up sounding a little bit robotic and a little bit um, formal. How do you allow your true authentic voice to shine through in your talk and, um, you know, your personality? I love this question. It's part of the process that I go through with speakers. Once we have a script written, a draft written, then we go through and what I call infuse the script with their voice. So I have a, this amazing client, Mari Carmen Pizarro, who is uh, a Latina bombshell. She's like a powerhouse leader, amazing woman. And she's got a very specific voice. She's very funny and very spicy and very Latin. So we go through her script and it sounds very boring and it sounds like it could be by it could be written by any corporate male in America. So part of that process is to go through and to transcribe and infuse your literal voice, how you would say something into the script so that you begin to rehearse it in your voice. So yeah. if there's a section on leadership, for example, and it's all about the, the, the S curve and how we have to go up to come down and all of this, find a way to say that like you would be talking to a girlfriend over a cup of tea rather than teaching us like a lecture, like a, like a, a college professor. Find a way to express these ideas just like you would if you were talking to your friend. And then all of a sudden your actual voice will come through and the talk will come to life. And we as listeners will be able to hear it for the first time because you're saying it. Even if we know this information, we'll be hearing mm -hmm. it for the first time because it's coming from your voice. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think that's something that is really important when you're doing, whether you're writing something or speaking something you've written, you've got to have your, allow your personality and don't be afraid of letting, you know, your, the slang that you might use or, you know, the, the kind of phrases that you, you know, pepper your conversation with yep. to come through because it's what makes people connect with you and what's make people know that it's you and not, you know, not somebody else um, doing it or, you know, some corporate um, faceless a machine writing it so yeah that's fantastic that's brilliant so um i'd love to hear from the um listeners and see what you think about um doing your own talk now i mean i'd love to know if you've changed anybody's mind given them um confidence to go ahead and craft their own talk are they has anyone come up with a big idea and had um a stroke of inspiration while we're sitting here chatting um making me laugh here i am a lecturer by <laughs> And I need to loosen up. <laughs> I think that is though. Um, I think that is the case though, because when you go to school or university, everything is so formal, particularly about writing. And you just get into this. That's what it's like when you sit down and write. You have to be formal, and you have to use big words and complicated words and make yourself sound intelligent or whatever. And it's very hard to to, to get out of that that um, that rhythm. So um, yeah, <laughs> that's funny. So. Um, Brilliant. So what, is there anything that I haven't um, kind of picked up on that you think is really, really important to consider when, when crafting your big talk and approaching this subject? I think giving yourself permission to explore this as a possibility for you in your life is where you need to start. We have to give ourselves permission to be more than we think we're able to. And I just wanna go back to the idea that we all have really important stories to tell. We're all unique human beings. And that makes our unique story important and worth telling because you could potentially change the life of someone else. You could potentially make a global impact and it's worth the stress. It's worth the hard work because in the end, you're going to have a product that is going to elevate you and give you more credibility. And it's gonna teach you something. You're gonna learn something about yourself by going through the process of identifying, crafting, and delivering a big talk. So I think it's something that everyone should roll up their sleeves and commit to doing. Yeah, I think, I think if you've got a story to tell, it's your responsibility to put it out there. And this is a really great way 
great way of doing it. And the other thing is, I think, um, you know, there's lots of things like I'm, I'm being a journalist, I'm a print journalist, I don't do talking face to face, I don't do not being able to edit myself as I go along and kind of like polish things up. And so, you know, even doing this, I was kind of thinking, oh, my goodness, I can't do that. But you've got to do the things that are outside your comfort zone you've got to do the things before you're ready to do them because otherwise you're never going to be ready to do them and it's what you know pulls you up and it's what um, makes you move on um so um yeah so and this is a great way so i really do hope you're all sitting down and doing your brainstorms and trying to come up with your big idea and is it i mean do you find you know would you have more than one big idea i mean because you're talking about contacting say tedx and saying what are you looking for i mean does, it's not just about one big idea. You perhaps have a you know a wealth of stories that you could be sharing. Is, I think so. Have you found that? So. If you consider themes that event organizers are having, and for example, our theme of looking beyond, that could touch on spirituality, it could touch on space travel, it could touch on oceanography, it could touch on many, many things. So there's so many ideas that could fit in within that theme. If you've got a theme that's bridges, perhaps that theme triggers a thought for you about what it means to bridge the gender gap or to bridge the leadership gap or to, you know, all of a sudden these themes from different event organizers could potentially trigger and spark an idea that's within you. Or you can also craft your idea to fit within a theme. So if you have I think the first thing you want to do is identify that one idea that you are so passionate about that you absolutely are woken up in the middle night, middle of the night thinking about and focus on that and find that event organizer that wants to give you the opportunity to step on the stage yeah. with that idea. And then all of a sudden you're, you're ready to do the next one. And I think the other thing is, um, it's not necessarily that's really come out of this. It's not necessarily what you think you're an expert in that you're going to be talking about. You know, it's like the lady you're talking about. It's not your, you know, say your, you know, your background is finance, but you know, you're not necessarily going to be up there talking about numbers. Right. You know, your, you know, the thing that you makes you engage could be something else. So don't be, don't sit there thinking I have nothing to talk about. I don't have a big talk in me. I think you know once you sit down and start doing that kind of brainstorming idea of what you're saying. I think it being amazing what you realize that you can talk about and what is your subject right um and the other thing i was also thinking about is the whole idea it's, it's not about promoting your business or trying to get you know more followers it's about giving back and i think that's so much of what um you know people who are really successful um it's they've not they're not out for the sale all the time. They are giving back all the time. And this is something that these talks are. You know, it's, it's about giving, as you said, giving a gift. If you want anything in return from your TEDx except for the experience and the potential of making a global impact, if you are looking for likes or views or any sort of um, success with the YouTube and TED community, it's not the right reason to do this because it's too much hard work. You have to really want to share your idea worth spreading so that you can affect change. And that's why you want to commit to this process because there's no guarantee you're going to have likes. There's no guarantee. The only guarantee is that you are going to be changed by going through this process. And that's a big, amazing thing to have happen. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Brilliant. I love it. I love it. Just looking, we have a couple more con theatrical academia. What a perfect <laughs> concept. Lovely. That's great. Thanks, Katrina. Oh, and oh, yeah, that's a good point, actually. Um, Ramonda's just said that um, I've had another do donation, and I haven't actually said um, that there is a donate button at the bottom. I know you've all um, donated um, for, to get your tickets today, um, but it's obviously a charity event. So if you want to feel moved and you're feeling like you're getting a lot of value from this talk today, please do press the donate button and yes. donate a little bit more because it's a really, really good cause. Um, any other questions coming through um, for Tricia? We've got her for another few more um, minutes before we have to go on. And um, we're running a little bit late, but I think we can hang on for a couple more minutes if there are any more questions coming through um so um what, what what have you taken away most from this um talk i'd love to know what it is what's the kind of message that you're going to go away is anybody going to go and um write their own talk now or approach tedx and find out please tell us i'd love to know um 
So, um, yeah, thank you so much, Trisha. It's been lovely chatting with you. Thank um, you for having it, me. What, 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 um, so, so tell me, what, what else have you got coming up? Have you got, um, oh, actually, I should mention your website as well. I mean, have you got any thing that you want to share with us about that you're promoting at the moment? Sure. Well, first, I'd love to give your listeners and your audience a free ebook called The Art of the Start, which is really a helpful tool to help you get started with this first draft. Because that's the scary part, like you said earlier, Catherine. It's like, how did, how and when and where do I start? So you can download this free ebook at the bigtalknyc.com forward slash start. Let me write that dot com forward slash start. And I'll put that in the box for you. Is it the big talk? The big talk nyc.com forward slash start. Big talk nyc.com forward slash start. I hope that's right. Is that right? That's perfect. Thank you. Brilliant. That's great. And if you want to learn more about the TEDx organizers, season eight of the Big Talk on iTunes drops on March 29th. Right now we're talking with um, speakers on what not to do from the stage. So that's the season that's up right now. And I actually go through the process of identifying and crafting and delivering a big talk with four speakers, which is season six, and that's episode 82 through 99. So the Big Talk podcast has a lot of really great information that can help give you the confidence to take your big talk off of the bucket list and put it on your to-do list. Because on there, you um, interview professional speakers, yeah, don't you? Do. And, and you find out their kind of insider insider tips on what not to do and what to do yeah. and what makes what best. makes a good talk how to write whether your book or your talk should come first is it the chicken or the egg there's a lot of amazing speakers who share incredible insight into the world of public speaking absolutely oh brilliant and that's called the big talk it's the big talk on itunes big talk. i'm going to put that in there uh, as well i'll put that in the box as well so everyone can check that out brilliant that's great Thank you so much. It's been so lovely chatting with you today. You. I hope the um, I hope the Wi-Fi picks up and uh, and and and, and this, you're able to get out in the snow Thank you. anymore. What's it like? Is it still snowing out there? It's not snowing anymore. They're just sort of cleaning up now, so all the snow is pushed to the sides on the sidewalks. And then hopefully springtime will come very soon. Yes. Thank you so much for your time, Trisha. It's just been wonderful chatting with you. Thank you. Um, so much, so much value, so much, so many actionable tips there. I mean, like everybody can go away from this session and know how to A, come up with their big idea and B, craft a really powerful speech that is going to resonate with an audience. And you've even given us tips on how to perform it as well. I mean, it's just been absolutely fantastic. Um, so thank you so much. And thank you all for all your comments as well. Um, right, Raymonda, shall we, um, are you going to, I don't know whether she